1995, 20 years ago, uh, what I uh, proposed was that there had been a gigantic global cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. I was very specific about that window, between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, uh, and that um, it had caused the obliteration uh, of an advanced civilization that is only now remembered in myths and traditions, and which is tor- historians and archaeologists uh, do not believe uh, ever existed. When I looked into this issue of a global cataclysm, it was evident uh, from, from m- many different lines of inquiry that something really bad had happened on the Earth between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. But when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I couldn't be certain what that really bad thing was. Um, and I, I looked into a number of possibilities relating to pole shift and, and most closely uh, into a mechanism called earth crust displacement, which was initially put forward uh, by a historian of science named Charles Hapgood uh, many, many years ago, and then was picked up and refined by Rand and Rose Flemath in Canada uh, in their book, when the, when the Sky Fell. And this is a very interesting proposition, really, the suggestion that the whole outer crust of the Earth can slip in one piece around the mantle or the core of the Earth. Um, and and um, it, it certainly would explain all the cataclysmic effects that were seen. Now, I'm actually still very interested in the Earth crust displacement theory. Um, but what has happened in the last 20 years is that we now have absolutely incontrovertible scientific evidence for what that cataclysm was between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. And in the new book, I haven't gone into the far reaches of the earth crust displacement theory. I'm concentrating on the new scientific evidence, and that concerns a comet impact with the earth. Interestingly, I don't go into this in the book, but I do have an article up on my website about it, actually put there in 2006, uh, by a researcher called Flavio Barbiero, which, which um, suggests that the two mechanisms may not be incompatible, that uh, a large object striking the Earth at an oblique angle might cause sufficient stress to the crust to set the crust in motion. Um, but what I've done in the new book is to concentrate entirely on the areas that are now uh, very much universally accepted by science, rather than um, repeat again more controversial arguments <laughs> that I explored in Fingerprints of the Gods. I, I'm, I'm trying to get my central point across, which is that we lost something from the human story between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. And it's just intriguing to me, since I proposed a global cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago in 1995, that since 2007, a major group of scientists, more than 30 of them, working all around the world at prestigious scientific institutions, have been presenting piece by piece the evidence for precisely such a global cataclysm. And to cut a long story short, what, they're, what they've proved, uh, their ride has not been an easy one. They've been peer-reviewed, they've been subject to criticisms and questioning by their scientific colleagues, but every time this has happened, they have simply strengthened their case by refuting the criticism with new evidence and adding further evidence. The latest paper was just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in July 2015. Um, And and, uh, cut a long story short, what they're saying is that a a giant comet with a diameter of about 200 kilometers uh, was drawn into the inner solar system or thrown into the inner solar system about 20,000 years ago. And that that very large comet uh, then went into an orbit around the sun that crossed the orbit of the Earth twice a year. Initially, there was no problem. But like other comets that we know about, for example, Shoemaker-Levy 9 that hit Jupiter in 1994, which broke up into multiple fragments before impacting on the planet Jupiter, uh, the evidence is that this giant comet also broke up into multiple fragments affected by the gravity of the Earth. And then, 12,800 years ago, eight, at least eight, of those fragments, some of which were as much as a mile in diameter, at least eight of those fragments hit the Earth, with the 
epicenter of the impacts being on what was then the North American ice cap uh, with cataclysmic effects because when objects a mile wide coming in at 70,000 miles an hour uh, hit ice that is two miles deep. Remember, this is the ice age. The northern half of North America was covered with ice two miles deep. When that happens, a huge amount of kinetic energy and heat mm -hmm. is unleashed. And basically, you have dramatic cataclysmic melting of enormous areas of the North American ice cap, which flood the land immediately south of them. And part of the book is an investigation of the flood features on that landscape uh, across the edge of the former ice cap. Um, and also pour freezing water into the oceans, which disrupt the Gulf Stream, radically affect global circulation, and cause a plunge in temperatures. And that's what you witnessed 12,800 years ago, a plunge in temperatures accompanied by massive wide-scale flooding and extinction of animals. We now know the reason for this. Uh, it was a comet impact, uh, fragments of a giant comet. I have to move quickly through this, but it, the evidence suggests that some 1,200 years later, 11,600 years ago, the Earth had further encounters with the fragments of this comet. So we are looking at a sustained episode of cataclysm, an extinction-level event that unfolded between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And interestingly, 11,600 years ago is the date that Plato gives us for the submergence of the lost civilization of Atlantis. He said that happened 9,000 years before the time of Solon, and the Greek lawmaker Solon lived in 600 BC. So Plato was saying 9,600 BC, which is 11,600 years ago, which is a date that coincides exactly with the scientific evidence, because just as the 12,800 years ago event was accompanied by massive global flooding and destabilization. So also was the 11,600 years ago event. And we've had further encounters with fragments of this comet since then, certainly in the Bronze Age. And the possibility remains that we may have to deal with further encounters with bits of it uh, in the future. So this is, the, <laughs> this is the, the, the scientific evidence. A lot of this evidence has not been put before the general public before. It's been confined to the rarefied atmosphere of prestigious scientific journals. And one of the things I've tried to do in Magicians of the Gods is to compress and summarize that information, footnote all of the references if people want to follow it up, so that, so that it's understood we have a powerful scientific case here. And that scientific case changes everything. Because, you know, historians and archaeologists have constructed their model of the origins of civilization without taking into account a massive extinction level event that occurred just in the backyard of what we think of as history. It's not their fault. This information is new. It's only been out there since 2007. But historians and archaeologists need now to scramble to take this evidence into account. And that's what I've done in Magicians of the Gods. I've taken the evidence into account and I've considered its implications for ideas, our ideas of the origins of civilization. And the answer is it massively reinforces the case for a lost civilization, especially <laughs> when combined with the evidence from newly discovered archaeological sites like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which is, as you said in the introduction, 11,600 years old. It fits in exactly with that second cataclysm. It's very sophisticated. It's advanced, a megalithic site, much, much larger than Stonehenge with precise astronomical alignments. It looks to me like the work of the survivors of a lost civilization who went and settled amongst hunter-gatherers and tried to transfer their technology to them because agriculture starts in the same area of Turkey at the same moment that the megalithic site of Gobekli Tepe is first created and then deliberately buried, not to be found for more than 10,000 years, reopened only in the late 1990s. It's a very mysterious archaeological site in southeastern Turkey, uh, which has... Which has um, completely revolutionized our understanding of history. Uh, and that site was not discovered when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods. It's one of the reasons that I'm writing a sequel. To be clear, this new book, Magicians of the Gods, is not an update of Fingerprints of the Gods. It's not an update at all. It's a completely new book from front to back, uh, you know, filled with new evidence and new travels to places I, I didn't talk about before, as well as to some places that I did talk about before, but with, a, but with a new perspective. And one of the key new sites is Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. 
Uh, what happened was that in 1996, a German archaeologist called Professor Klaus Schmidt from the German Archaeological Institute uh, came across a site that 20 years earlier had been surveyed and dismissed by a couple of other archaeologists. They dismissed it because there were very fine bits of carved stone sticking out of the ground. And the work was so good that they concluded, they were looking for Stone Age stuff, and they concluded this was Byzantine. It was from the Middle Ages. It, 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 um, it wasn't of interest to them. They passed it by. But Klaus Schmidt had had some experiences on sites in Turkey which led him to think again about that. And he went back and took another look at that site and began to excavate it. And what he discovered was a gigantic megalithic complex. Uh, it's on the, on the scale of Stonehenge multiplied by 50. It's, a, it's just a gigantic place. So far, 80 or 90 percent of it is still under the ground. We know it's there because of ground penetrating radar. But what they've excavated so far are these circles of gigantic megalithic pillars uh, with pillars weighing, you know, 20, 20 tons and standing 20, 25 feet tall. Uh, with precise astronomical alignments and very, very beautifully put together. Now, here's the thing. The dating of that site is absolutely definite. Uh, it's very difficult to date stone monuments, actually. Carbon dating won't do it. Carbon dating only dates organic materials. So when an archaeologist tells you that we've carbon dated a site, what they mean is that they found a bit of bone or a bit of charcoal which is associated with the stone object, and they've deduced that the stone object is of the same age as that piece of organic material, and that may not be the case. Mm. What's special about Gobekli Tepe is that whoever made it, whoever mysterious people made it, 10,000 years ago, they deliberately buried it. They covered it in what appears to be a pot-bellied hill. That's what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language. And for 10,000 years, it remained absolutely untouched by the hand of man. Uh, sealed away like a time capsule. That's not true of any other megalithic site. You can go to the megalithic temples in Malta, for example, which are thought to be five or 6,000 years old, and uh, they've been trapped over by every human culture for thousands and thousands of years. And the dating is actually, in my opinion, very insecure on those sites. We may be being misled by, uh, to give falsely young dates by the introduction of later organic materials to those sites. That didn't happen at Gobekli Tepe, and it allows, um, it, it allows us to say for sure that this site is in the range of 12,000 years old. It may be significantly older than that. Let's see what else comes out of the ground, but what they've got now, we can be absolutely certain, is 11,600 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is, <laughs> for, for those who haven't studied archaeology and history, it might, that, you might think, well, so what? Well, here's what. Stonehenge, famous megalithic site, uh, is less than 5,000 years old. It's 4,500 4, years old, according to the mainstream chronology. All of the megalithic monuments, famous ones of, of Europe, uh, whether in Malta or Menorca or in Brittany in France, for example, or in Spain or in Portugal, they're thought to date to that horizon, uh, five to five and a half thousand years old. Nobody is supposed to have been creating gigantic megalithic sites six or seven thousand years earlier than that. Why? Because our ancestors, 11,600, 12,000 years ago, were what they call Upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherers, Old Stone Age hunter-gatherers. They are not supposed to have had the organization or the social structure that is needed to create a large-scale architectural project. It just doesn't fit in to the pattern of history. Secondly, Evidence is now compelling that at the same time that Gobekli Tepe was being made, whoever made it, they also, quote-unquote, invented agriculture. Suddenly, agriculture appears in southeastern Turkey, at the same time that monumental architecture suddenly appears. And the, to me, the interesting issue is, what is really going on here? Did a bunch of hunter-gatherers wake up one morning and think, ah, we're just going to create this humongous megalithic site with really, really challenging engineering uh, problems, which we've never encountered before, but we're going to do it brilliantly. And by the way, at the same moment, we're going to invent agriculture. Is that realistic or are we looking at the transfer of technology? Are we looking at the survivors of a lost civilization who, after a great global cataclysm, settled in Gobekli Tepe? 
and used it as a, a center of innovation to, to introduce the notion of, of settled civilization to the tribes that lived in that area at that time. See, even today, we have a, a global situation where we have advanced technological cultures coexisting with hunter-gatherer cultures. There are people in the Amazon who don't even know, you know, America exists. Um, they, they've had no contact with technological society at all. And I believe it was the case uh, 10, 20,000 years ago as well, that there was an advanced civilization on this planet uh, and that there were hunter-gatherers. And the advanced civilization was destroyed. Now, the second thing that is of great importance in the new book, Gobekli Tepe is one of the reasons. There are many other sites now being discovered that don't fit the paradigm. There's an incredible pyramid site in Indonesia called Gunung Padang, which also features prominently in my book. But more important than that, in a way, is that I have now what I didn't have in 1995. And that's a smoking gun. That is the incredible work that's been done in the last uh, seven, eight years by a large group of scientists. There are more than 28 of them who co-author the papers in journals like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences or the Journal of Geology or the Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And what they've been demonstrating not without opposition, they have faced opposition from other scientists, but what they've been demonstrating is that our planet was hit by a comet 12,800 years ago. It's taken so long for the evidence for this to come out because there doesn't appear to be an obvious immediate crater. The reason there isn't a crater is the comet broke up into fragments. Some of the fragments were very large, about a mile in diameter, and those large fragments impacted what was then the North American ice cap. North America, roughly from Minneapolis northwards, was covered in ice two miles deep. This was the ice age. And the impacts were on ice. So the craters were transient. They were formed in two mile deep ice. They instantly liquidized that ice. They caused cataclysmic flooding across what are called the channeled scablands of the Columbia Plateau. You can particularly see them in Washington state. Uh, and they caused just unbelievable volumes of icy water to be released into the world ocean, disrupting the Gulf Stream when it flew into the Atlantic and the Antarctic Oceans, disrupting the Gulf Stream and changing global climate. Now, geologists have known that something weird happened then. 12,800 years ago is the beginning of a period that geologists call the Younger Dryas. The world appeared to be coming out of the Ice Age, had been for a few thousand years, and then suddenly it goes back into conditions of extreme cold. It now appears that that was because of the comet impacts on the North American ice cap, and that that uh, extreme cold resulted from the disruption of ocean circulation. 1,200 years later, 11,600 years ago, the exact date that Gobekli Tepe appears to have been founded, something else happens. The world suddenly reverses its climate again. The Younger Dryas ends. Global climates shoot up by the order of 10 to 15 degrees in a, in a single lifetime. Uh, it, it's extraordinary what happens. Again, the comet explains this. The, the, the broad argument is that we're looking at what is called a giant comet, which had originally a diameter of about 150 miles. This giant comet broke into fragments. 12,800 years ago, about eight of those fragments hit the Earth, and many small, big fragments and many smaller bits. It was an extinction-level event. This is when uh, the megafauna, the mammoths, the, the woolly rhinos, the, the giant beavers, and, and so on and so forth in North America went extinct. Um, 1,200 years later, the Earth encountered the debris stream of the comet again. This time, the impacts were in ocean. They caused a huge cloud of water vapor to be thrown up into the upper atmosphere and created a, a dramatic global warming, which resulted in the, the further climate change that took place at that, at, at that point. Um, and, and so we have a period of 1,200 years between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago when a previously undetected extinction-level event 
on the scale of the event that made the dinosaurs extinct happen. Now, previously, scientists used to think extinction-level events, encounters with asteroids and comets are, are, on a large size are very rare. Of course, we encounter meteors all the time, but they're just harmless little firework displays. Um, they happen, the big ones, they used to think they happened like every hundred million years. So archaeologists have not been inclined to take them into account in the story of human history. The discovery of this comet impact totally changes all of that. What we are now having to get to grips with is that just yesterday, in historical terms, right at the beginning of the time when the story of civilization that's told to us by historians and archaeologists seems to begin, right then, just before that, there was this incredible punctuation mark, a global cataclysm on an almost unimaginable scale. And suddenly, all the myths and traditions of a lost civilization, of a golden age, of, of um, uh, global floods and, and cataclysmic earthquakes, they all make complete sense. And, uh, you know, so the, the point I'm making is that history for the last 11,600 years, history and archaeology, may have built a pretty good house. But that house has foundations of sand because they are not taking account of what happened immediately before that. They're not taking account of this extinction level event. So I've written this new book to bring all this evidence, both the archaeological evidence, the mythical evidence, and the evidence concerning the comet, to bring it all together in one place and put it before the, the general public. And that book's going to be published in, on the 10th of November 2015 in the United States, earlier in Britain on the 10th of September in Britain and in Canada on the 3rd of November. But it's all happening in the, in the next few months. And I'm, I'm just absolutely nailed to my desk doing the final work on the proofs and the diagrams and the photographs and so on that are going to go in the book. But it's, it's exciting for me to revisit this subject and to do so with completely new evidence. To, to, because I took a lot of flack when I published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995. I can't begin to tell you the, the insults that were thrown my way by archaeologists and historians and their friends in the media all around the world, uh, you know, who were absolutely convinced that their reference frame of history was right and that there could be no lost civilization. Uh, what's happened in the last 20 years is just a mass of new evidence that's come out. And that evidence needs to be put before the public in a coherent way. And that's why I've written Absolutely. The and let's, let's look at the word history. Mm -hmm. It has the word story in it. Right. <laughs> His, history is a narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a story. Uh, it should not, be, should not be mistaken with the facts. Mining out the facts behind the story is a, is a work in progress. It isn't, it isn't complete yet by, by any means. Um, there are deep mysteries hidden in our past. And I believe we need to get to grips with those mysteries in order to understand what we are, actually, and how we function in the world we live in today. And, and to realize that we have, we have too much hubris, too much confidence in ourselves and our technological society. In many ways, in mythological terms, we meet all the criteria of the next lost civilization. Uh, and this becomes an issue worthy of taking seriously when we realize that so recently such a gigantic cataclysm took place upon the earth. Just, I, I'm not going around the world wearing a sandwich board saying that the end of the world is nigh, but twice a year our planet crosses the debris stream of that fragmented giant comet. We still cross it today. It's called the Torrid Meteor Stream. And every October, late October, early November, we have what some people call the Halloween fireworks, where you get fantastic meteor showers that come bursting in through our winter skies. Nobody thinks that they're dangerous. They're just pretty things to watch. But the astronomers who've worked on this field are very concerned about the Torrid Meteor Stream and the possibility that there may still be large fragments of that original giant comet circulating in the stream along with the much smaller ones that are responsible for the meteor showers. It's something I think science needs to take a proper look at. I think science is in denial 
about this at the moment. Science doesn't like cataclysms. There's a strong tendency in geology to, to be what they call uniformitarian, uh, to imagine that, that, that things as they are now are a good guide to things that how they always were in the past and that change operates gradually. It may not be so. And in fact, the lessons of deep prehistory suggest strongly that it's not so. Don't forget, it took 10 years for the notion that the dinosaurs were made extinct by an asteroid to be accepted. Initially, that notion was dismissed as folly by most of, most of science. But Lewis and Walter Alvarez stuck to their guns and they kept bringing forth the evidence. And finally, they found the gigantic Chicxulub crater off the Yucatan and, and I mean, proved that. There's a central point that at the moment we have another unexamined theory or reference frame regarding visionary experiences that human beings have. And that unexamined theory or reference frame uh, is that these visions are just quote unquote hallucinations, just uh, our brain on drugs, if you like, yeah. or our brain misfunctioning, uh, somehow manufacturing and producing these, these weird experiences. But that's only a reference frame. That isn't a fact. That is based on an idea about the role of the brain in consciousness. But another possibility exists, and that is that the brain is more of a transceiver or a re receiver of consciousness. And what these powerful substances may be doing is resetting the receiver wavelength of the brain and allowing us to gain access to other levels of reality, normally invisible to our senses. So once again, it's a different aspect of my work. I'm very interested in, in visionary experiences and their role in the origins of human culture. And I wrote a book about that published in 2005 called Supernatural. But what's in common between Supernatural and the new book, Magicians of the Gods, is that I am challenging an established reference frame. I am saying there are bits and pieces of evidence that do not fit into to that reference frame. And if we fail to take them into account, then we're unnecessarily confining ourselves into a narrow, narrow tunnel of inquiry rather than opening out into all the possibilities that await us. Well, we don't understand what consciousness is. I mean, any scientist who says they understand what consciousness is, that they've absolutely got it nailed, um, <laughs> is uh, not speaking the truth because, because nobody does under, understand it. We understand that the brain is connected with consciousness in some way. But exactly the nature of that connection remains to be revealed. I mean, we have this few pounds of sort of unpleasant jelly inside the bony container of our skulls. Um, and certainly our skulls and that unpleasant jelly are material things. They're objects. They, they, you can weigh them. You can, you can measure them. You can assay them. They're, they're physical objects. So how those physical objects, that physical object that we call our brain, how it allows us, where are we? Are we some little homunculus in the back of our head watching a picture being projected through our eyes? Allows us to have experiences which include intangible issues like love, our reaction to a beautiful sunset or a symphony. How, how those, that physical object transmutes this into conscious experience is utterly unknown at the moment. It's a, huge, it's a huge mystery, and it's a mystery that touches upon the nature of reality itself and what it is that we're living in. How do we know that this is real or that this is the only real? This is the mistake, I think, that, that another branch of mainstream science, in this case not historians and archaeologists, but uh, material scientists who m m seek to reduce everything to a material substrate. This is, this is where I think they're missing a trick, actually. The materialist science relating to consciousness simply says that our consciousness is an accidental byproduct of brain activity, that it's a kind of illusion. It, 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 and there's nothing real to it. It's just... It, we needed these big brains in order to compete effectively in the Darwinian jungle. Yeah. But, and, and as an accidental byproduct of evolving these big brains, we got this thing that we call consciousness that we don't understand. And there's nothing more to it than that. That's the view of materialist science. You know, it's all, it can all be reduced to matter. And that's why I use the telescope analogy. Because yes, physical changes do take place inside the brain when we're having visionary experiences. But can those experiences be reduced to the physical changes inside the brain? I'm not sure. Same with a telescope. When we look at a star, we have to focus the telescope. When we focus the telescope, physical changes take place inside the barrel of the telescope. The star comes into view. But we'd be wrong to say that the star is just the physical changes inside the barrel of the telescope. And I think it's the same kind of mistake that we're making 
about the brain. We need to not be so addicted to our reference frames. We need to be open to contrary evidence and explore it and see where it leads us and see where it goes. And that's what I try to do in, in, in my books as a researcher. And the Amazon are not unconnected from the outside world. They know what's going on in the outside world. They have the internet in Iquitos, <laughs> which is a city in the heart of the Amazon. Um, and, and they don't like what they see. They don't, they don't, they don't like this looming aura of, of disaster and horror that is, that is constantly being spread by, by those who run the world. Uh, they, don't, they don't like that at all and they see a problem and, and the problem they see with this huge industrial technological complex that we call the West but that of course includes Japan and China and, and, uh, and all rapidly industrializing and technologically based societies, the problem they see is that these societies have indeed severed their connection with spirit, that we've come to regard spirit, that aspect of ourselves that can't be weighed and measured and counted, We've come to regard that as an illusion because we reduce everything to matter. Uh, and, and this is the biggest mistake that a society could possibly make. Uh, we do need to reconnect with spirit. And my view, this is not said by the, the shamans, but my, my view is that the three mainstream monotheistic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, no, are no longer fit for purpose. They are part of the problem in the world today rather than part of the solution. Uh, we need to go back to a more ancient form of spirituality, but using our modern techniques and tools. I'm not a, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not saying we should abandon modern technological advance. I'm saying we should, we should mitigate it with a willingness to embrace spirit. And shamanism provides an excellent model for that because that's about direct contact with the realms beyond. Um, and I think what we need to do in the West is to develop our, or redevelop because we've lost our shamanistic roots. We need to redevelop learning, for example, from the peoples of the Amazon or the peoples of the Kalahari Desert. We need to develop our own form of shamanism that works in a highly complex technological urban setting. Wait, now we have the shamans of the Amazon who are traveling to the West, bringing the medicine ayahuasca, the vine of souls, this powerful visionary brew. Uh, extraordinary visionary brew, which I wrote about at length in my book, uh, Supernatural, I've talked about qu quite a bit. They are bringing ayahuasca to the West, to the technological societies, because they feel we desperately need it, and that actually this may be the only way to save the world from the hunger, the, the rapaciousness, the, the cruelty, the absolute lack of ethics and morals of technological societies. Uh, which is we, this short-term pursuit of, of immediate profits, which are literally bringing our societies to the edge of collapse for, for, for no useful gain, um, that all of this mindset needs to be changed. This state of consciousness that is dominating the West at the moment needs to be changed. Shamans know that, and they, they are convinced that ayahuasca is the way to do it. And that's why you can drink ayahuasca in any major industrial technological city in the world today. It's, it's, all, it's there. It's come out from the jungle. It's been brought out by shamans as an urgent remedy for the sickness of the technological societies. Mm. It's, it's okay. extraordinary. It's one of the mysteries of ayahuasca. It's why more cross-cultural research needs to be done because there, there are certain aspects of the ayahuasca experience that crop up again and again all over the world, regardless of the setting, whether it's a big city or the middle of a jungle, whether, whether the people have compared notes or not, whether they knew anything about ayahuasca before they drank it or not. All of this has, has been done and there are these astonishing transpersonal connections. Um, as though all of us are peering into the same usually invisible uh, pa parallel realm. Um, this, is the, this, is, this is what's really remarkable uh, about, about ayahuasca. But, and it's why, it's why I feel that much more detailed research needs to be done into the Amazonian brew itself, in which the active ingredient, although I don't particularly like that phrase because it's much more complicated than that, but the active ingredient is DMT, dimethyltryptamine, the most powerful hallucinogen known to man. Well, um, we also have research work that's been done with pure DMT in human volunteers by, for example, Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico. And I think that we have an amazing tool here for the investigation of the mystery of human consciousness. And we are failing to use it at the moment for purely ideological reasons to do with that absurd uh, 
evil and malicious project called the war on drugs, which is really a war on people and a war on consciousness. We have to set these ideologies behind us and pursue the healing potential of the psychedelics and beyond that. Yeah. Because some work is being done now on the healing potential of psychedelics, and I welcome that. But beyond that, we need to realize that we have an incredible tool for the investigation of the mystery of consciousness and of the mystery of reality itself, and that structured scientific experiments could be devised involving human volunteers and DMT which might explore the nature of reality further. Why should we not do that? Why should we, you know, we're spending a lot of money exploring outer space. Let's spend a wee bit exploring inner space as well and let's, you know, get rid of the ideology and the knee-jerk reactions that have been set in motion by nearly 50 years of mind programming called the war on drugs which has been an unmitigated failure in its entire half century of operation, which has caused untold misery, which has restricted uh, the human family from manifesting and expressing itself in the ways that we, the ways that we should. The war on drugs is evil and wicked, and it needs to be ended right now. One such healing uh, was the the amazing results at uh, Takiwasi Clinic in Peru. Um, and that's you know, right. So what I mean, Takiwasi Clinic in Peru, Dr. Jacques Mabit uh, for a while, Gabor Mate in Canada, um, getting drug addicts. I mean, people who are addicted to really harmful drugs like heroin and cocaine, um, getting them off their addictions to those hard drugs with ayahuasca. A month of ayahuasca sessions will produce a revelation that results in well over 50% of the subjects completely giving up their hard drug habit, breaking their addiction, no withdrawal symptoms, and no return, no return to, to drug addiction. The astonishing results, yet Gabor Mate was getting the same results in Canada, but he was stopped. He was banned by the Canadian authorities on the grounds that ayahuasca is a drug. So it seems that the Canadian authority would rather give heroin addicts something horrible like methadone which is itself addictive, would rather give something horrible like methadone than investigate this extraordinary new avenue uh, for, for, for ending drug addiction. Ayahuasca is primarily about, about healing. That's what it's always been about uh, in the Amazon jungle, and that's the role that it continues to play today. So again, we just have to abandon, we have to take off these ideological blinkers and look at things as they actually are. There is a preformed narrative I've discovered about me and about my work, which, which mainstream archaeologists and historians and their friends in the media just buy into wholesale without actually ever needing to talk to me yeah. or to read my books. Um, and, and um, you, you know, the, the suggestion is that I'm, you, you know, that I'm saying this is definitely how it was, and that I never do that. What, yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is that there are anomalies, there are puzzles, there are issues in our past that are that are unexplained and so far we've only been given one side of the story and that's the side of the story uh, preferred by those uh, who regard themselves effectively as being in control of our past the experts who uh, mediate between us and our past and, and 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 transmit to us their knowledge of our past those are the historians and archaeologists well good for them and they do some fantastic work which I highly respect, but there is room for another point of view, especially when it comes to something so important as the origins of human civilization. Mm. Uh, and especially when we discover that we have an extinction level event right in the basement of what historians and archaeologists say is the beginning of history. Uh, this is a real problem and it has to be, it has to be taken into account. I'm not saying that I'm 100% right or even 50% right. I'm saying that here is an area we need to explore and here is what's known about it right now. And it looks like it changes everything yeah. about how we view our past. Let's consider it. That's Absolutely. all I'm saying. Let's consider this. Let's any take this into account. investigator of any aspect of reality um, is looking into it hopefully with a rational mind and um, uh, investigative tools and certain material begins to come out and then they start to formulate a theory about what all that material might mean. What happens is a kind of alchemy is that over a period of time the theory about what all those bits of evidence might mean becomes mistaken for a fact uh, people start to react to it as though it is a fact, as though it is real, as though it is something other than a theory. And 
that at that point it's it's approaching the level of a religious belief because here is actually uh, simply uh, a speculation about the nature of our past, but it's being dressed up and presented as though it's absolutely true. Uh, and there could be no alternative explanation. And it becomes a reference frame, or if you like, a pair of spectacles through which the past is viewed. And it becomes very difficult to see anything that contradicts that. Um, and it's referred to as, sociologists know this, it's called cognitive dissonance. That, that if you are presented with um, ideas and evidence that utterly contradict deeply held and cherished views of your own, you're going to reject that idea as an evidence, inevitably, because it's so uncomfortable for you to have to, to have to accept it. And this is true of everybody. Everybody suffers from cognitive dissonance regarding their core ideas. But it becomes a serious problem when an entire profession that has been given sole responsibility for interpreting our past to us is suffering from cognitive dissonance and will not consider any alternative than the model, the theory that they have been working with for the last hundred years or so. Mm. But it's just a theory. It's not facts. It's a theory built on bits and pieces of evidence. But the further back you go into the past, the thinner the evidence becomes and the more like a fairy tale it becomes. And that's what I would say we're looking at with mainstream history and archaeology. Great work for the last 9,000 years, but everything before that's pretty much a fairy tale. These are, these are transient craters that are formed in ice that is two miles deep. And when the ice melts away, very little evidence of the crater is left. Actually, in the last year or so, shock effects that were, in, that were on the ground under the ice cap have been identified. We have now uh, about four major potential craters that have been identified. But it's important to be clear that the scientific evidence up till now, excluding those traces of craters that were left after the impact had been absorbed by the ice cap, that the bulk of the evidence up to now is what are called impact proxies. Again, you have to consider the tremendous heat and kin kinetic energy of these objects coming in and hitting the Earth. And when they do, they create very definite, very recognizable side effects. Those include nano diamonds, diamonds that can only be seen under a, a microscope formed in the shock and heat, melt glass, which is virtually identical to the melt glass that you get in nuclear explosions, uh, evidence of temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade, that's beyond the boiling point of quartz, um, uh, carbon spherules. There are very specific proxies of a cosmic impact, and they are distributed across more than 50 million square miles of the Earth's surface. And the latest scientific paper published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in July 2015 makes clear, it's a Bayesian chronological analysis, it makes clear that this was all one single event that unfolded literally in a single afternoon. It was not spread out over hundreds of years. It wasn't slow and polite and gradual. It was instant, massive, worldwide. And there's only one explanation for that, and that is the impact of a large object uh, coming in from the solar system. Because, because I, I happen to believe in reincarnation. And, and actually, if you go into the studies, it's, it's a little bit beyond belief. I mean, there is, it's not just a matter of belief. There is, a, there is powerful evidence that, that reincarnation occurs. So, you know what happens? Mysterious reality uh, has come up with something that's a much better trick than transhumanism, uh, that we can have multiple lives, experience many different, learn and grow as souls and spirits in many different incarnations in many different ways. And from that point of view, it would be a really bad idea to live in the same body for hundreds and hundreds of years in the same, in the same circumstances. What, what you need is to shuffle the deck and come back in totally different circumstances. Maybe you were a billionaire in this life. Maybe it's really good for your spirit in the next life to be born a pauper uh, and to have to wrestle with that and, and, and deal with that. You know? That's what reincarnation offers, which transhumanism appears to be seeking to, to take away. So I have, I have no problem with, with, with technology as such. But we have to do the spiritual work first, and that should guide our approach to technology. It shouldn't be the other way around. And I'm afraid the mainstream religions, again, this is my opinion, the mainstream religions, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam in particular, I don't think that they offer a format to do that spiritual work. The spiritual work has to be at the level of direct personal experience. The problem with the West, and they... 
they're very aware of the problem. You, can't, you shouldn't imagine that people living in the Amazon jungle are out of touch with what's happening in the world. They're not. They know what's going on in the world. And their, their diagnosis, their analysis is that the fundamental problem with Western technological society, which includes societies in the East like Korea and Japan, you know, the, let's just call it technological society, that the fundamental problem with technological societies is that they have severed their connection with spirit. Uh, that we have immersed ourselves too deeply in materialism, both in terms of the way we live our lives, that we define ourselves in terms of production and consumption, but also in terms of the basic philosophy, that there is nothing else to reality except the material realm, that there is no spiritual dimension to life. This is a very strong view amongst intellectuals in technological societies, that there is no such thing as a spirit. Um, from the shamanic perspective, this is a very dangerous view, and it explains why so much harm and damage uh, is being done around the world by technological societies. And that's why what I call a kind of reverse missionary activity is underway. And it's why shamans from the heart of the Amazon are willing to even take risks with the law and to come to Western countries and to offer ceremony and to train up Westerners with ayahuasca because they know that, that ayahuasca can give you such a powerful kick up the ass that it will make you, it will make you think again about everything. Always, always used with the right intent. That's, that's very, very important issue in this. But if it's used with the right intent in the right way, with experienced hands, responsibly, with love, with care, it can completely change one's outlook on life. And that's why I've often said, I think, I've said it about materialist scientists and I say it about politicians too. My, if, I, if I had the power to implement this, I would say that anyone running for presidential office, anyone running to be prime minister of a country, fine, run for it. But first, a dozen ayahuasca sessions. <laughs> Have those sessions, then run. That's the, you know, that is the... Um, threshold obligation that you must meet in order to run for power. I suspect quite a lot of them actually wouldn't want to run for power anymore. Right. Uh, and those who do, I think many of them would operate in different ways. And that's what shamans feel. And that's why fundamentally what we need in technological societies is that huge kick up the ass. We've got to stop being so complacent. We've got to stop feeling that all the answers to all the problems come from technology. That's why I have a problem with transhumanism. You know, the, the idea that, that we're going to manipulate the human genome, that we're going to introduce all kinds of technological solutions which will make human beings live for hundreds of years and do so in a healthy physical form. That all sounds very desirable, and it may be. But unless we solve the, phys the, the spiritual problems first, unless we address our spiritual darkness, unless we address the dearth of real spiritual connection in Western society, it's a waste of time to do any of that. Uh, we're, we're, we're putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, technology is great. Yes, we can use it for wonderful things. But if we haven't got our heads straight first, then the outcome will not be wonderful, in my, in my view. So I would say transhumanism is being used as, as yet another reason to ignore the spiritual dimension of life and to concentrate entirely on, on physical enhancements. Mm -hmm. And those physical enhancements, in my view, are a waste of time if they are not accompanied by spiritual enhancement as well. And I happen to believe from my own experiences, from deep research into the subject, from my connections with many, many people around the globe who've worked with ayahuasca, that ayahuasca, used right, used responsibly, can do that. Very interesting to me, though, what's happening in America at the moment. Because, uh, you know, at one level, uh, you know, the U United States is the heart of the power structure. It's the heart of the Western technological power structure that dominates the world. But at the other level, at the level of individual Americans, mm -hmm. something very different is happening. I sense, I sense a huge awakening in America taking mm -hmm. place. And, we, and this may be regarded by some as a trivial example, but I regard it as a very important example, which is state by state, marijuana is being decriminalized. It's being made legal. You know, we've had 40 plus years of propaganda from the war on drugs. We've been We've been beaten about the head, lied to. Millions of people have had their lives ruined, have been, have been sent to prison. What, what, for, for smoking cannabis? It, uh, 
uh, utterly absurd. And, and, and America has driven this process, this so-called war on drugs, all around the world. So it's very, it's very pleasant for me as an observer to see that it is Americans, individual Americans, state by state, who are winding that in and who are refusing to allow that shit to go on any longer. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just in, just very recently in, in Colorado, and I, I really value and appreciate what's happening there. Adults are actually being treated as adults. If we choose to smoke or imbibe cannabis in some other way, that's our free choice. There's no policeman going to come and break down our door and ruin our reputation and, and send us to prison for, 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 for so doing. And it's not only Colorado, it's, it's Oregon, it's Washington State, it's Alaska, it's medical marijuana being, being legal in, I think, more than 22, 23, 23 states now. The, the engine of the war on drugs, which had federal America behind it for so long, which caused so much suffering and pain in the world because the war on drugs is an unremittingly evil enterprise, in my view, that is being stopped by Americans at the grassroots level, just the way Americans at the grassroots level stopped the Vietnam War. So America has a, a very, there's this very, there's great power in the population where when the people wake up, they can really change things. That can't happen in Britain. You can't imagine, you know, Yorkshire or Northumberland deciding to legalize cannabis. It would never, never happen, but it does happen in America, and it's setting an example to the rest of the world. But right. Cortez, from his childhood, believed himself to have been inspired by St. Peter and had frequent encounters with the entity that he construed to be St. Peter in the realm of dreams. He, he was reportedly uh, saved from a fatal childhood illness by the intervention of St. Peter, and ever afterwards, St. Peter was his patron saint. Likewise, Moctezuma, uh, we, we, we know from the historical annals, felt himself to be in regular contact with Hummingbird, the god of war, uh, and, and uh, that that contact was absolutely facilitated by eating what they called the flesh of the gods, Teonanactyl, the, 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 the psilocybin mushrooms, that he would enter a trance state, and in that trance state he would encounter this entity who gave him incredibly bad advice and, and always wanted him to conduct more murders to, to feed him to feed him the souls of more sacrificial victims. Um, the, there's a definite historical basis to to both of these types of encounters, but the the construal that I put on them is my own, of course. Right, as well as the idea that he was the return of Quetzalcoatl. That's well, now there there's something really strange. You yeah. see, there there was a prophecy of the return of Quetzalcoatl. Brief to, to summarize it briefly, there was in Mexico a classic battle between good and evil that was remembered as having unfolded in the distant past. There had been a, a, a deity, a, 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 human, a deity in human form, who they called Quetzalcoatl. The Maya called him Gukumats. Uh, the, the it means the feathered serpent, the, the plumed serpent. He had been a god of peace. Uh, he, he forbade human sacrifice. He, he enjoined people to sacrifice only fruits and flowers, never to, never to take a human life, um, and, and, and ushered in what is remembered as a golden age and a reign of peace. But then there came a conspiracy of evil uh, against him, uh, demonic entities, hummingbird uh, amongst them, uh, who sought the overthrow of Quetzalcoatl, and who succeeded, and who drove him out of Mexico. And he, and he is said to have sailed from the coast of the Gulf of Mexico at a place called Coatzacoalcos, which means the serpent sanctuary. He's said to have sailed from there on a raft made of serpents. It's very peculiar. But as he went, he promised that one day he would return. And when he did so, he would come back with others. And they would be in boats that moved by themselves without paddles. Uh, and that they would return to Mexico and they would overthrow the rule of evil and bring back the rule of peace. And that this would happen um, at a particular date in the Mexican calendar, which was the year one read. They called it the year one read. They had year names. Um, and this was to be the year one read. And it's a very bizarre thing that the exact moment that Cortes landed in Mexico 1519 was the beginning of the Aztec year one read. 
So he, mm. he fulfilled an undoubtedly real existing ancient prophecy. And he looked the part. He came in ships that moved by themselves without paddles, sails. Aztecs had never seen sails before. Um, uh, he, he was equipped with all kinds of weaponry that they'd never seen and never understood. There was a particular weapon that they was spoken of in the ancient traditions of Mexico as a fire serpent, which would, bolts of fire would come out of it. It would dismember human beings. It was a terrible, powerful weapon. And the Spanish had fire serpents. Of course, we call them guns. Um, and and uh, so many other aspects of the Spanish were mysterious and supernatural. The very fact they rode horses, only 16 horses amongst the whole Cortez army, 16 heavy horse, but, you know, my God, 16 heavy horse coming down on you at 30 miles an hour, <coughs> men on their backs armored in steel, the horses themselves armored in steel, the ground shaking under their feet. There were very few uh, indigenous Central American armies that could bear that sight. They felt they were confronting gods, they, they, this terrible supernatural beings. For quite a while, they really weren't clear that this was man mounted on the back of animals. They thought they were dealing with some kind of hybrid entity. Hmm. Eventually, the, that myth was, was punctured, but, but that, was their, that was their first notion. Um, and and uh, so they were, you know, hugely at a psychological disadvantage. It really looked like the fulfillment of prophecy. And Cortez cynically, calculatedly took advantage of that. That was, you know, Cortez was a Machiavellian player. His, his, his principle was anything that works. If I can use something that will work for me, I will, I will use it. And he saw that he could use that. And he cleverly did use it. It's not that he ever pretended to be a god, but he allowed that superstition amongst the Aztecs to to grow to massive levels so that Moctezuma the first time Cortez and